Uh, now, I'd like to invite you to take a deep breath and be present as we light the chalice of our Unitarian Universalist faith. The mission of our fellowship is to nurture spiritually courageous people who transform the world through justice and compassion. Tomorrow just happens to be National Public Lands Day. I hope you were able to view the film Public Trust, The Fight for America's Public Lands. But if you weren't, I'm going to um, read the synopsis from the producers. In a time of growing polarization, Americans still share something in common. 640 million acres of public land held in trust by the federal government for all citizens of the United States. These places are a stronghold against climate change, sacred to native people, home to wildlife, and intrinsic to our national identity. But today, despite support from voters across the political spectrum, they face unprecedented threats from extractive industries and the politicians in their pockets. Part love letter, part political expose, public trust investigates how we arrived at this precarious moment through three heated conflicts, a national monument in the Utah desert, a proposed mine in the boundary waters, and oil drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and makes a case for their continued protection. And we are very fortunate to have an excellent panel with us tonight to discuss their perspectives on these issues. Elian Stefanik of Conservation Lands Foundation's California Program Director. Oh, sorry, is the Conservation Lands Foundation's California Program Director. Elian oversees CLF's work to protect, expand, and defend California's national conservation lands by building and strengthening grassroots advocacy and community partnerships throughout the state. Prior to joining CLF, she worked at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, where she, among other things, spearheaded the foundation's sustainability practices and facilitated projects aimed at improving the organization's environmental footprint. Earlier in her career, Elian served at-risk youth and adults through a program that offered alternatives to incarceration through community and habitat restoration. Elian's completed ecological research in California, Belize, and New Zealand. She holds a master's degree in environmental management from the University of San Francisco and a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Jesse Prentice Dunn is the policy director for the Denver-based Center for Western Priorities, where he advocates for conservation and responsible energy development practices on Western public lands. Before joining the Center for Western Priorities, Jesse served as senior campaign representative for the Sierra Club, where he directed the organization's efforts to increase vehicle efficiency and increase access to public transit and safe biking and walking. An Alabama native, he is a graduate of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Sean Anderson, CSUCI Professor of Environmental Science and Resource Management, is a broadly trained ecologist who has tackled environmental questions from Alaska to the South Pole. While pursuing his PhD in marine population biology at UCLA, Sean became increasingly interested in restoration ecology, eventually heading up a large salt marsh restoration effort at Mugu Lagoon in Ventura County, California. After graduate school, Sean joined Paul Ehrlich Center for Conservation Biology at Stanford University and began expanding his restoration and conservation work. Since joining CSUCI, Sean has continued his work around the world, including large-scale ecological restoration projects across California, Louisiana, and Eastern Turkey, for which his team was awarded the 2008 Whitley Gold Award for International Conservation. I'm going to turn the program over to our presenters. Elian. All right, thank you so much, Randall. And thank you, Randall and Pamela and Brian um, and Community Chalice Forum for hosting this conversation tonight and, and for having me. Um, as Randall mentioned, the timing is perfect with uh, National Public Lands Day coming up tomorrow. And it gives us a great opportunity to really think about 
and hopefully you can all go out and explore our beautiful public lands. Um, as Randall mentioned, I'm Conservation Lands Foundation, or as we call ourselves, CLS, California Program Director, and I have the honor of overseeing our work here in California. We work with 27 grassroots and community organizations across the state to help them and empower them to be the most effect effective advocates for public lands and issues in their communities as possible. Um, and before I get started into our work, um, I want to share a little just personal anecdote. Um, I came to this work um, through, through various avenues, having wanted to explore first community work and actually not really seeing myself um, ever working in public lands. I had an early understanding of public lands being tightly associated with wilderness and um, the definition of wilderness being one where not everybody was necessarily welcome or where um, people who look like me, people with black or brown skin weren't necessarily welcome. And it wasn't until I, I learned more about the work of Conservation Lands Foundation and many other grassroots organizations that I, I truly came to understand that public lands protection can happen in many ways and it doesn't just have to happen in a certain siloed way. And so I'm happy to, to be doing this work because it's, it not only protects public lands in perpetuity against extractive development, but it also, the work that we do also focuses on the community-based advocacy, which I think um, the movie Public Trust really touches on and, and hopefully you all got a chance to see it and at least hear some of those personal stories from uh, those advocates that they highlighted. Um, and Brian, do you have my slides? Perfect, there we go. And you can go, go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, really quick, the Conservation Lands Foundation focuses on a suite of system of public lands called the National Conservation Lands. And similar to the National Park System, um, the National Conservation Lands are a system of protected public lands um, that are managed by the B Bureau of Land Management and stewarded in, in, in actually public trust for, um, for all Americans to enjoy. And what's special about these lands is that they are um, they're multi-recreational. You can go, you can ride your OHB vehicle, you can go bike riding, you can go hiking, but they also are protected really with conservation as their primary goal and in recognition of the living cultures and histories of the indigenous people. They also serve as solutions for climate mitigation and help maintain the remaining migration corridors for wildlife. And they broadcast, as I mentioned, a broad range of recreation activities. Um, and of course, help sustain the recreation-based economies for uh, rural communities, but as well as um, the, the, na the national economy as well. Um, and the Conservation Lands Foundation works um, in many different states uh, across the West, from the Western Arctic in, in Alaska, to Red Rock Canyon and Basin and Range in Nevada, to the Oahis in Oregon, to Bears Ears and Grand Staircase in Utah, and then across here in, in California, including the California desert and our entire coastline, um, which encompasses the, the California Coastal National Monument. Um, and again, the Public trust really highlights those, those personal stories of those um, advocates that are passionate about the places that they're trying to protect. But it also highlights really what's at risk um, under this administration and under many other administrations, regardless of who's, who's in the White House. Um, and I really appreciate as well the awareness that they bring to, to this important issue. You can go to the next slide. And again, what I really value about the work that we do at Conservation Lands Foundation is this, the, the impetus of community-based advocacy. Um, we strongly believe that conservation should start in communities and that communities who are most impacted um, both negatively and positively, positively from these public lands should be at the forefront of conservation efforts and should also be considered in management decisions, protection decisions, um, for uh, the permanent protection, but also in how these lands are managed. Um, it's also noteworthy, I think we, we all recognize that all of these lands are also indigenous lands and they were stolen from the natives who were, all, who were here before us. And uh, an opportunity that, that public lands protection brings is also engaging with the tribes 
um, and looking at, at, at ways that the lands can be protected that not only honor the indigenous connections, but also look at ways that um, the lands can be co-managed and shared with the indigenous people. Um, uh, another note too, in, in, in our work with, uh, with grassroots organizations is, is recognizing that communities benefit from these lands. Um, of course, you know, we think about, you can think about the broader issues like climate change and clean air and clean water that I think Jesse and Sean will really touch on, but the community impacts uh, I feel are, are just as important. Um, we know now with research and data that, that access to public lands provide um, clean air, um, access to clean water, and that access to public lands actually leads to a, redu a reduction of stress and even can help relieve the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly for children. So I think again, the, the value of community-based advocacy and really working with community leaders and the people who are impacted um, by both extractive development and also protection of these lands should be at the forefront of conservation efforts. And you can go to the next slide. And so at Conservation Lands Foundation, as I mentioned, we, we do much of our work through partnerships with grassroots and community organizations. And we facilitate a, a network of around 80 or organizations across the West. Um, and our role really is to ensure that they are the best advocates possible. And where we can, as a national organization, we help to ensure that their perspectives and their voices are heard in all land management and conservation decisions and efforts. Next slide. And in thinking about um, durable conservation, by investing in these community-based advocates and organizations, we as, as a network and as, 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 as a community of conservation um, advocates, we're fighting for places like Bears Ears and Grand Staircase, Escalante National Mon Monuments in the courts. We're working to hold the Bureau of Land Management accountable to its conservation mandate. And we're forging partnerships with diverse users of the national conservation lands to stand in solidarity across political lines. And working to defend the Antiquities Act to, prevent, to protect national monument designations. Next slide, please. And in looking ahead, um, we've We've, we've forged our way to even in, under this administration secure more conservation. Um, and our, our community-based advocacy is setting the stage for successfully protecting places in the future. And another um, thing that Jesse will get into, but looking ahead at how we can really, how public lands can really serve as a way to help um, the world mitigate the worst impacts of climate change by looking at how we can conserve 30% of our lands and waters by, by the year 2030. Next slide. And if there's, if there's one thing that you can take away from my presentation tonight is one, um, looking ahead that we're 38 days from the elections, uh, really encourage you all to join us at Conservation Lands Foundation and um, register to vote if you haven't and make sure you go to those polls or or send in your ballot ahead of time. Um, because well, as we can see, a lot is at stake. And again, thank you all for, for being here tonight. Great. And Wonderful. with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jesse. Yeah, thanks so much, Eliana, I appreciate it. Um, so as Randall so kindly mentioned, I'm Jesse Prentice Dunn, the policy director with the Center for Western Priorities. Um, I just wanted to say particularly how excited I am to be here with you all tonight. Um, I was born and raised in the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, so the few and the proud uh, in Alabama, and so I, I appreciate all of your work. Um, I appreciated the chance to get to watch Public Trust, and uh, it's certainly a, a cause that is near and dear to my heart, uh, being a longtime user and lover of public lands and now a transplant to the West where I kind of get to live amongst them and, and work on them. So a, a quick background on the Center for Western Priorities or CWP, the acronym that everybody loves to use. We advocate for proactive con uh, conservation and energy policies in the Rocky Mountain West and unfortunately in the last three and a half years have kind of turned into some sort of a, a watchdog uh, over the Trump administration and chronicling all of the 
the bad things that have, have happened. So we've done that nationally at the state level and then also do a lot of public opinion research. So uh, I'll kind of touch on a lot of those different elements uh, tonight and then I'm, I'm looking forward to a good conversation. Uh, so Brian, if we want to do a PowerPoint, everybody's favorite. <laughs> So the, the central thing I want to talk about, the, the film was really about the attacks on public lands, and I kind of want to dive into this notion of are they under siege or uh, have we made progress? What's the, the current <laughs> state here? Um, so we can go ahead and, and go to the, the next slide. But as, as the film touched on, on one of these three um, landscapes, Utah has really been the center of the public land transfer movement. Um, their politicians uh, for a long time have advocated uh, for that at the state, county, local level. And probably kind of the Magna Carta of the land transfer folks happened in 2012, the Utah Transfer of Public Lands Act. Uh, kind of a quixotic piece of legislation that demanded the feds turn over all federal public lands to the state by 2014, two years. It passed. They were going to have millions in legal bills, taxpayer expenses, and they even provided four and a half million dollars you kind of taxpayer you money to do that. Um, okay, this good. is something that faced long odds in the courts. Um, it, it was scandal ridden with the, the state paying more than $500 an hour to their attorneys taking first class flights. It's gone nowhere, um, but has been a central tenet of Utah politics. Uh, so next slide. I, I want to talk briefly about the cost. In the film, they mentioned that transferring public lands, federal public lands to the states would be de facto privatization. So I wanted to dive into that. It's because, uh, as they mentioned, states can't afford to manage these, but I wanted to highlight two specific costs, wildfires and abandoned mines. Um, since 2002, the feds have spent more than $3 billion a year on fighting wildfires. I know this is near and dear to your hearts right now. The same in Colorado, um, and, you know, as we've had uh, crazy fires, smoky days, um, and it's only going to be increasing in the, in the face of climate change. Uh, so next slide. If you look at state budgets when it comes to wildfires, and this is, this is kind of outdated by now, it's only going to increase 2011 and 2012 data, but this shows you that the Forest Service is spending more on fighting wildfires than the entire law enforcement budgets of certain states. And so if we transfer federal public lands over to states, I mean, they have no shot. They have no chance at managing this stuff. Um, so it's really going to incentivize selling off public lands, privatizing them uh, to the highest bidder. Uh, next slide, please. So abandoned mines are something that is, is huge in the West. Um, California, no different. Um, it, billions of dollars for this mining legacy, particularly in the Cal Desert. You see here under a high, high end cost estimate, more than $4 billion to reclaim mines in California. I mean, this is something that states in the West don't have the money for. And so just to underscore that um, this folly of transferring public lands into state hands that somehow, you know, you're going to get a boon from grazing it, mining it, drilling it. Uh, there's just no room for that. Um, so next slide. So one of the, the featured folks in the film was Ken Ivory, the guy you see on the left. He's a Utah state legislator, um, kind of the um, chief spreader of a lot of this ideology. The film mentioned he worked for ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, kind of the coke funded um, think group for, for state legislatures, all true. Um, and then he also founded his own group called the American Lands Council, um, almost a sketchier group uh, where they went around the West like snake oil salesmen, solicited dues from county commissioners, state legislators, um, and tried to spread this gospel of transferring public lands into state and private hands. Um, just a note, he's since quit his job at the Utah State Legislature and gone to work for the think tanks that he was funding with taxpayer dollars. So he's an especially sketchy dude. Um, next slide. So now to the good news is that all of this was burgeoning in the 2012 to 2016, 2017 time range, and it really ran into a brick wall. I mean, 
the film public trust mentioned the federal bill that representative jason chaffetz in utah had sponsored to dispose of three plus million acres that went nowhere but i think it's really worth noting that um in montana in idaho in wyoming republican uh, controlled legislatures shot down bill after bill and resolution after resolution on transferring public lands to the states. I mean, they tried everything from studies, weird um, law enforcement control bills, straight up land transfer, and it went nowhere. So Utah is really an outlier and a lot of this was beaten back. Um, so next slide, maybe two slides even, yeah. Um, and I, the reason for this is that support for public lands and conservation, in my mind, has become just a third rail of Western politics. I know um, Sean is going to talk about this in his presentation, um, but it is just an increasing outdoor voting block in, in the West, the Mountain West in particular. So in we've done polling for years, most electoral cycles, and our most recent poll we conducted was in June of 2020. Uh, we hired a Republican pollster that we've worked with for a long time, make sure we weren't skewing questions too much. Um, but our findings really underscore this. So what you're seeing now is that over 81% uh, of voters in the Mountain West say that public lands, parks are a key um, factor in who they vote for. It's true across party lines, it's in every state, um, and what we've seen over the years is that this is ramped up. It's no longer a second tier issue. Folks care about it and they vote on it. Uh, next slide. And that, that's all the more true during the pandemic. Surprisingly, we were polling in June and what we found is a third of voters said that these issues are more important now than prior to the pandemic. I mean, I know I, uh, when I've been cooped up in my house, getting out to a trailhead, getting out on the river, it's one of the best things that, that we could still do. And I think uh, folks in the West have always appreciated the importance of the outdoors, but now it's it's been underscored. And I think the thing that impresses me most out of this is that Republican voters had the highest on this out of all three parties that we, we polled, that it mattered more than ever. Um, next slide. Um, in all the polling we've done over the last three and a half years, other folks have done it. Colorado College, everywhere else, there is broad opposition to the Trump administration's rollbacks on public lands. I mean, we've asked about everything from rolling back national monuments to the Endangered Species Act, mining near the Grand Canyon, you name it. It's not popular. Um, there's a narrow constituency for it. Um, again, there's a split on party lines, but I, I think it's really telling that Voters care about these issues, they care about them more than they have previously, and they don't like what's happening right now. So it's a, an interesting mix. Um, next slide. So I, this is kind of a gratuitous point, but I wanted to mention something that I was able to, to work on a, a couple years ago where um, when Bears Ears and all these national monuments were being threatened by the Trump administration's rollback, um, we decided we wanted to do a road tour of the West and go to a lot of these national monuments, highlight local communities that were fighting for them. So we rented a, a Sprinter van, somehow convinced the rental company that we were going to wrap it in our own custom graphics of Monuments to America, uh, got a 50 or 30 foot inflatable Statue of Liberty and drove from town to town doing press conferences about national monuments and why communities care about them. Um, and we were really able to see that this is driving passion. People care about it. Um, and so this was from Denver all the way out to Palm Springs, everywhere uh, back and forth. And, and we were fortunate um, in that to work with Patagonia on that as well. They were really um, uh, generous with their time and resources and staff. So that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, next slide. And you can skip to the next. This is my Zoom background of theirs. <laughs> um, so Elian mentioned that kind of the next big idea in conservation is protecting 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030. This is kind of a, you know, there's always been a recognition that what we have is so valuable. We need to preserve it. But I think 
right now, there's increasing recognition that we are losing a football field worth of natural area in the U.S. every 30 seconds. It's dramatic. You see it from urban sprawl. Uh, I see it from oil and gas and mining in the West. At the same time, I mean, the UN, World Wildlife Fund, have put forward reports saying that biodiversity is plummeting. Um, it's bird, mammal, fish populations, everything. So it's really important. And climate change is only going to make it worse. It's a real stressor. And, and so I think the benefit, it, what we're seeing is that this is an issue that you can drive by fear or by hope. And I think it's both. But the hope is that this effort can help strengthen local economies in the West, particularly that have been living in boom and bust cycles uh, on drilling and mining. Um, we've, it's something where we can help preserve it for future generations and for public health. I mean, the coronavirus is something that was exacerbated by the loss of wildlife and zoonotic transmission to humans. This whole notion that uh, we're decreasing habitat, we're increasing the risk to our public health. So it's an important um, uh, effort. And then I, we've commissioned a video. We work with some pretty cool folks on, I'm hoping we can show it now that they can say it much better than I could. So Brian, we'll see if it works. If not, no worries. It's very exciting. It's, it's so it's, the tension is building. It's going to be so good. I know. <laughs> Just having a little issue here. I think I've got it now. My name is Hendrik Sala. I am a National Geographic Explorer in Residence. I work to save wild places to restore the richness and productivity of our natural world. I'm Senator Tom Udall from New Mexico. I'm the author of the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature. We have transformed half of the inhabitable land, cutting forests for farms, grazing, and cities. We're losing a football field's worth of nature every 30 seconds. We have replaced wildlife with our domesticated livestock. We have killed 90% of the large fish in the ocean. People have already heard a lot about the threat posed by climate change, but we hear less about the nature crisis. The truth is we have to solve one to solve the other. They can't be separated. We've been able to see the decline of nature around us because of the work of thousands of scientists working across the world over many years collecting data on everything from temperature to abundance of species. We're in the middle of a sixth mass extinction. Human beings continue to destroy nature at a devastating rate. Between our assault on biodiversity and global warming, we are destroying our life support system. Humanity is deeply reliant on mother nature for our way of life. The extinction of one species has profound ripple effects that can alter industries, economies, global health, and security. Imagine a world without bees to pollinate crops or fungi to derive new life-saving medicines from. There is nothing more urgent, in my opinion. Scientists like Dr. Salat tell us we need to protect 30% of the land and water by 2030 and continue at that pace to save nature. If we don't meet this goal by the end of the decade, it's going to be too late. Everything that we will not preserve by 2030 probably will be lost forever. I don't mean to be an alarmist, but being bold is really our only option. I've introduced a bill in the Senate. It's called the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature. It sets a goal for the nation of protecting 30% of our land and water by 2030 with half protected by mid-century. Then there are a variety of policies we can undertake to achieve that goal. New national monuments, wilderness areas, and other protections. Establishing wildlife corridors. These corridors will protect biodiversity and species habitat. Reforestation efforts. 30 by 30 is about protecting the best and also restoring the rest. The good news is that when we give nature space, she can bounce back spectacularly. 
and continue providing for us. I have seen places in the ocean that were degraded, that were dead, come back in just a few years after protecting them from our activities. The only way we'll get there is if the American people continue to organize like they have been, to show their leaders that they won't accept anything less than bold action to save our planet. Nature is much more resilient than we think. Nature has this spectacular ability to bounce back if we just give her a little space. If we get to 30 by 30, we can save our planet and make sure our children have a livable world. We can live in better harmony with nature because protecting the planet at the end of the day means protecting humanity. Well, thanks for that. I appreciate your indulgence. Um, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Sean Anderson. Awesome. I love that video. That was a cool video, dude. I, I, I have to use that in my class. That's good. I like that. Um, uh, so uh, while the slides are coming up, I'll just say uh, uh, excellent, uh, cool, inspirational stuff by my, my um, colleagues here. And I'm going to pick up uh, where Jesse, um, the same themes that Jesse was talking about. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a, of a um, uh, perspective on uh, loss of stuff. And I think, um, I think if we just hit the, the um, little easel thing next to the minus, I think then it'll show full screen, I think, on the on the bottom there. Um, but uh, yeah, from the beginning is cool. That's good. Um, yep, perfect. I should make it go magically large, or maybe not. Uh, in any event, let's start going. So um, I'm gonna talk to you guys just real briefly here about um, protected areas and about uh, the fact that we actually love them. And so I think when we watch these types of movies, we should be enraged, we should be, um, uh, uh, bummed out and, and anger and angered and all that kind of good stuff. But it's also important to say that we really do, um, uh, think more alike than we think differently. As Jesse was showing with that data from the Intermountain West, we see the same thing here. And I'll show you that in a little bit uh, here in, in coastal California as well. So next slide, pretty please. Um, so when we started creating our public lands, our, our protected areas, it was originally seen as this low cost endeavor. Um, so this is a, a Moran illustration of Yellowstone the year before it became um, uh, a national park, our first national park, the first one in the world. And so it's true that this was uh, native people's lands and, and all of the stuff that comes along with that. But nevertheless, from our societal standpoint, we saw these things initially as a low cost endeavor, things that were far away, things that were nice to do that wouldn't really cost us too much and were maybe a nice thing to do, but that was about it. Number next, please. Um, and since, that, since 1872, the, this notion of putting aside land um, in all types of forms, wilderness, uh, urban parks, all these things, it's really become a, a key cornerstone of modern conservation. And we could, I could show you a million different pieces of data. This, this little one here is just from Hawaii. So this is from the island of Oahu. This is uh, near the main uh, urban capital. That's Diamond Head we're looking down on right there. And what we're looking at is a protected area in the water. And so the little boundaries, the, the white uh, boundaries there show different areas where people are not allowed to fish, right? People can still surf there. They can still snorkel and do all that kind of stuff. Um, the area outside of that, those white boxes are where people can fish as much as they want. And what you're seeing here, the, the yellow dots illustrate um, the abundance of fish. So the, the amount of fish, the diversity of fish is much higher in these little areas. They grow bigger, um, they have more babies, all that great stuff, just from setting things aside, even just a little bit, even here on the edge of this huge urban area, um, even when we just change one human behavior as opposed to all the human, beha human behaviors, um, these things really are a cornerstone of modern conservation. Number next, please. And this idea that started with Yellowstone, which is revolutionary, right? Um, so before when we set things aside, we set them aside for the king. We set them aside for the wealthy folks. The, the key idea here was um, preserve for everyone, right? And so what starts in 1872 expands, firstly just expands over the land, and then in recent years has expanded into the ocean, but it's become an incredibly popular thing. And we just heard about the current 
um, a movement to try to save 30, a, per, a certain proportion, 30% of our land and water in some form of protection uh, by 2030. Number next. Um, and it is true that as soon as, as long as we've had these areas, there's always been some threats. And I would characterize the threats that we've always had as, as sort of like the regular threats. So for example, on the cover of National Geographic here from um, a while ago, uh, we see this coal-fired power plant uh, over the, the hillside, those smokestacks that were tainting the air in the Grand Canyon, making it um, fewer days could we see across the Grand Canyon than we would just see smog. Um, and that was to provide power for us in Southern California primarily. Um, all kinds of bad things with that, using of uh, water and a parched landscape and all kinds of this and that. But, but that is as bad as that, as that power plant was and as challenging as that power plant was, I would characterize that as something of the regular types of threats that our, our public lands and our protected areas face. Um, this is another example here on the left. This is our, we have a, our university operates a research station on Santa Rosa Island. And this was um, a day of a couple years ago when we were suddenly banned from the island. We all had to leave, campers, everybody had to leave because some illegal drug smugglers from Mexico had landed and dumped all their drugs on the beach and it was kind of chaotic. So, so this idea of, of constantly needing to manage these systems and constantly needing to be vigilant has always been a part of the uh, playbook that always will have to be a part of the playbook. Number next, please. But something really different happened, in my opinion, starting in 1981. In 1981, um, President Ronald Reagan appointed uh, this gentleman here, James Watt, to head this, the Interior Department, and things really started changing then. And so I would characterize this new era as, as something of um, a, a new modern barbarian era. And so now it wasn't just a power plan. It wasn't just a thing here or there, as challenging as those issues might have been, but a whole scale rejection of the benefits of protected areas, not even to acknowledge them and talk about balance, but just to say these things didn't matter at all, never acknowledge them, and then assert grievance. I have been fundamentally assaulted by the fact that we have this area in public trust and, and held for uh, the plants and the animals and future people. Very angry about that. And that has only continued. Number next, please. So um, it continued, continued on to the 90s. And so here is a, a quote from the uh, then mayor of uh, Escalante in Utah. And he said uh, lots of crazy things. But one little quote here is, I don't see where the Escalante Grand, St Grand Staircase Monument has brought any jobs for our community. Manifestly incorrect, right? We can measure this and we know that's not true, but so it's this notion of, of pushing forward, um, not sort of half truths or not things that maybe we could see it that way, but things that were a complete rejection of reality. Number next. Uh, and then we saw as this, this movement continues to meta continue to metastasize, we saw um, increasingly crazy things I never thought I would see in my lifetime. And so this was the the assault and the takeover of a national wildlife refuge, federal land by armed people with assault rifles that trashed Native American uh, uh, artifacts, uh, trashed federal records, and essentially did what they wanted to for uh, quite some time. And I would suggest to you that if those folks had been maybe uh, brown or black, I don't, I don't know if they would have been allowed to hang around with assault rifles for as long as they did. And it should be, it should say that all these folks were um, acquitted in the uh, trial that came in the wake of this. So that was in the eyes of the law, this was deemed okay and acceptable. Number next. Um, so, so that's the era that we're in. So that's, that's the context to think about um, and reflect on the, the, this fantastic film that you all hopefully have watched. Um, and that really set the stage for the, the most recent round of, of attacks. Um, but what I want to end on, um, so I don't want to take too much time here so we can get to our questions and, and witty banter and all that good stuff. But um, I want to uh, just follow up real briefly with a little bit of data from, our, from my students, from our work here in coastal Southern California, looking at public attitudes and, and, and public perception. So we do a survey every year. This year, it's a little bit strange because of COVID. We normally do face-to-face -face surveys. Um, but uh, we survey uh, the public every year, um, primarily Los Angeles, Ventura, Santa Barbara counties. Um, number next. And we ask a bunch of people a bunch of questions. So they typically these days it ranges between about 1,000 and 1,500 people every, every uh, fall. Number next. And uh, so I want to talk to you about uh, 
how we are perceiving, we here in our local community are perceiving um, um, public lands, protected areas, all this, these wonderful things. So let me orient you on this weird nerdy science thing. Uh, so we ask people, are you strongly supportive? Are you supportive? Do you oppose? Do you strongly oppose? A whole variety of, of management uh, efforts. And I've cut almost all of them out. I'm just showing you a little teeny bit of these. But what I want you to first look at is, is the zero. If we fell out on the zero, people would be totally neutral. If it goes up towards the graph, if it goes more positive, people are much more supportive. If it goes below the zero, people are much more negative. And there actually are error bars here. It's just they're so small you can't see them. So um, number next. So the first few here, I'm just, again, I've cut most of these out. These are just representative samples. One would be, how do you feel about banning of DDT? How do you feel about uh, uh, the banning of uh, single-use plastic bags and the bag bans that have swept over California in the last several years? How do you feel about the cultivation of marijuana, right? A very, very, uh, almost everybody has an opinion on that. Uh, the establishment of the California Coastal Commission, which the UN has descri described as the most powerful land management agency in the world. Uh, and then dealing with homeless, attempts to deal with homeless folks in our uh, uh, protected areas and, and parks and things of that nature. So you see these, these areas, which you might think uh, would, it, would invoke a strong response, and, and I think that's a reasonable thing, they're not quite as strong as some of the other things. What are the things that people are more positive about than things such as DDT banning and, and things of that nature? Number next. That is the establishment of protected areas, the establishment of these, these public spaces that we set aside in perpetuity. So the most popular one um, that we, and, and we ask this question every couple of years, and every single year it's always been number one, that's the establishment of Channel Islands National Park. Everybody thinks that's a good idea. Old people, young people, uh, uh, people that live inland, people that live on the coast, people that have a high income, however you want to slice it. Everybody is very positive about the establishment of that national park. The next most popular thing is the establishment of California's network of marine protected areas. Uh, the, this network of things underwater to, um, to help us recover our fish stocks and things of that nature. Number next is Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and the establishment of the Santa Monica National Recreation Area, where um, technically my house is in the footprint of this, my campus is in the footprint. Uh, the sphere of influence of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. So that's all super positive. So out of dozens and dozens of, of different actions, management choices that we ask about, these four are the most supported, the most positive uh, decisions that, that um, we feel that our elective representatives and, and, th and those of us that are representing us in government um, have done. So that's fantastic. And then number next, the lowest score for many, many years was that first red dot there, that was the 2012 closure of California state parks because of the budget crisis. So for a long time, that was a super outlier. That was the most negative. People really didn't like that. Really, 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 really didn't like that. Um, in the last uh, year or two, a few other things have raised, have come to the fore that people like even less. And that is public utilities attempting to avoid liability for starting wildfires. People don't like that and the exiting of the Paris Climate Accord. Again, across the board, old, young, every, nobody thought that was a good, or very, very, very few people think that's a good idea. But by far, the least supported thing, the thing folks believe is, is the worst management decision we've made of all these things we've surveyed over the years, is the reduction, the trimming, the, the degradation of our national monuments and parks, right? So, protected areas, the most popular thing when we start them, everybody loves them, just like what Jesse found in the Intermountain West. And and the worst thing we can do is to harm our access to those areas or actually harm those areas themselves. Number next. Uh, we go to, we use these areas all the time. Again, this is data for our, our localized California coast. Um, um, the first one is how often do you, we ask folks, how often do you go out to, to natural areas, to parks, to forests, to, to uh, you know, anywhere out and about in nature? And so the first line there is how many people go out, or say that they go daily to one, of, to one or more of these sites, and then weekly and monthly, et cetera. The second row is a measure of at least that much. So 11% of people go daily. Uh, Weekly, you take the weekly number and add the daily number to that, and you get the percentage of folks that go at least weekly and so forth. What you find is that uh, two-thirds of us 
go to natural areas at least monthly. And, and 92% of us go a few times a year. So these are, these are things that we all use, whether we're a, a mountain biker or just an occasional hiker, or we got a dog or whatever. Similarly, we've asked about formal, um, um, not just any old natural area, but what about national parks? And so that's the lower image here. And what we see here is people report going to national parks less frequently, which makes sense because they're, they're not necessarily in their neighborhood or, or next to their house. But nevertheless, what we find is, again, if we look at the bottom where at least this many people go, we find that about half of our population go um, you know, at least a few times a year to these sites. If we talk about going at least once a year, it's it's seventy percent of our population go to these formal protected areas. So people really, really um, love these areas. We really, really utilize these areas. Some of us utilize them more than others, but this is this cr cuts across our our community. Number next, and then just to finish up here, before we get going on some some questions and, and the witty banter, that's going to be much more interesting than what I'm talking about. Um, is uh, something that I'm particularly worried about. So again, the big picture here is as much as we are divided in our country, as much as there, there are, are some serious, serious challenges that we're facing, um, as with everything, we're not as far apart as maybe it sometimes appears um, uh, in, in terms of all the, the, the news coverage and the, and the rhetoric and such. Um, but one thing that I am worried about is some of the ancillary damage that might that I fear may be, be being caused by this ugly language and this horrible uh, conversation that, that some people seem to want to push. Um, and that is some people are feeling less safe and some people are feeling that these protected areas are not for them. And so we first started noticing this in 2015 um, in, the run, in, in the run up to that uh, last presidential election. But what we started finding is that um, some of the folks that we were surveying were reporting um, very seriously not wanting to go to particular areas because they did not feel welcome in those areas. And so we started asking, hey, have you ever avoided going to, in this case, it's beaches, because we do a lot of work on beaches. Have you avoided going to this beach or, or a similar beach because um, of the way other people looked or because of the way you were um, felt you were being um, treated by other people, et cetera? And what we find is, is that number hovers around 11 to 14 percent, and it's been pretty stable. So there's a significant chunk of our population that has avoided going to these areas. That is their heritage. That is all of our heritage um, because they don't feel welcome. And so we started doing some more polling around that. Number next. And so this is a, this is a, a slightly different, ver different way to ask this, but um, we've been tweaking this for a couple of years. And then in 2019, this is what we asked. We asked how people, how safe people felt um, going out to open spaces. And so, um, again, zero here represents people are, are, are super neutral. They, they, they don't feel safer or, or less safer or, or, you know, they're neutral about going to these areas. And so we asked, how safe did you feel in 2000? How safe did you feel in 2015? Just as we noticed this thing started uh, percolating up. And then how safe did you, this was data from last year, how safe did you feel in 2019? And uh, again, the error bars are very, very small here. So all of these levels are significant. And what we see is people feel less safe, felt less safe in 2015 versus 2000. But then we see this, this pretty significant drop off in, in recent years. And this appears to be more pronounced in households that speak Spanish and households from folks that might be in more marginalized communities. And that's a huge issue. Again, these, this is our collective heritage. This isn't the heritage of, of person X or person Y. This is all of our heritage. So, so one thing I'm particularly worried about is that this conversation, even if we're able to, to protect uh, bear's ears or, or, or wherever we're talking about, I'm worried that there might be some long-term damage being done. And some people, some communities might be taking away the notion that it's just a better thing for them not to engage with these wonderful resources and not to be a part of that. And we've had too much of that in our history, and I really would hope that um, that, that does not become the legacy of, of this, this um, very acerbic debate. Um, and so with that, uh, that happy talk, <laughs> I think that's my last slide. Number next. I think we're good. And awesome. So there we go. So it's time to chat. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to invite my uh, two other colleagues to rejoin us. And we are going to start to do some witty banter amongst ourselves. We're going to ask each other some questions and start to talk. As we're doing this, remember, you guys are more than welcome to add new questions into our chat. 
and we have a, a shared document here, and those questions will will start to pop up here thanks to the magic of our uh, of our internet god that will make them magically pop up. But but having said that, I'll um, I'll ask the first question to my colleagues, um, and I'll say uh, so. One of the things that I've noticed in the debates that I've been a part of, and in in the film in particular, was this notion about um, people seeming to have very divergent views of the same same situation. And so, so objectivity, impartiality, um, it can be a challenge in these debates. And um, particularly when some sides, I think, might be actively interested in, in pushing forward misinformation or, or, or mischaracterizations of what, what reality is. So I'm asking you guys, how frequently are you seeing really honest differences of opinion and people just truly really don't, don't see things eye to eye versus um, really more of a sort of intentional deception and in trying to trick the conversation to a certain way, whether that's discussions of so-called energy independence, which we could never really have, or, or local control, or, or whatever the, the, the game is. So, so tell me about what your guys' thoughts on uh, objectivity and impartiality and that, that good stuff. Well, I, I can go ahead and start, and then Elian, you can add. Uh, I kind of see two sides to this, right? On some of the bigger... Um, some of the local issues in the West, I, I've seen a lot of kind of misinformation, uh, bad faith. I, the local control example, I think, is a really good good one near and dear to my heart in Colorado, where we've had a big boom in fracking. There's been a robust debate around uh, things like how close can you cite a well to somebody's house or a school? Um, and that's something where um, a lot of local communities have been frustrated by the lack of state action and it pushed for uh, to regulate whether it's their city or their county. Um, and we've seen, uh, I think, a lot of bad faith arguments from industry, from certain state reps to say, oh, no, we're all for local control, except when you're stopping oil and gas next to a school. Um, I will say when it when um, while there are some of those arguments, when I see it not applicable is on um, some of these uh, local land management discussions. So I, I appreciated that, Sean, you touched on Escalante in Utah and the towns next to Grand Staircase, um, some of my favorite places in the world. And I think objectively where you can say now, um, these places, the designations are powering their local economies. They're really sustaining it. And that's something you can't um, rebut in with some sort of talking point. It's just apparent. And so I, I think when it when it's that real, then you can kind of cut through the bull crap. And then when you get industries involved and a lot of private money, then there's a lot of uh, misinformation. Totally, totally. Yeah. And, and I'll add um, another argument that I've, that I've seen and heard a bit is also about the this notion of um, government overreach, um, particularly when um, considering public lands protections or the role that the federal government will play in managing a land and managing adjacent lands uh, next to private property, and certainly um, landowners can can be very will express concerns around. Well, what does this mean? You know, I don't. We don't want the federal government making decisions on my behalf. My my property abuts these lands. We don't want them. Um, to make decisions that therefore impact my ability to graze, to do whatever on their public lands. And there's a bit of, there's a bit of a misconception there as well because um, oftentimes those lands are already managed by the federal government. And when you have a protection, it also kicks forward a management planning process that um, I think in, that that requires the input from the public and it requires the government, to take into account that that input, and there are different points in that process where um, the government should be taking into account the recommendations from the public. Um, unfortunately, under this administration, they have they have made attempts to cut those that public process out or make it um, less streamlined, make the the comment period shorter. They offer they've been offering fewer public meetings, and in the during the pandemic, even offering. Um, fast tracking planning processes while folks and communities are facing many other challenges. Um, but there are opportunities to, um, again, influence management decisions when it comes to um, managing these lands. Yeah, I think one thing that I've seen consistently over the last uh, 15 years or so, I guess it's longer than that, but I'm 
most conspicuously is is that exact thing that you're talking about, which is which is an attempt to gum up the system intentionally, right? So so we can't kill the Endangered Species Act or whatever. But we can we can defund it. So instead of taking you know 12 months to do a study, it takes 36 months. And understandably, the landowners that are trying to get the permit for whatever, they're just like, oh my god, I can't get this thing through the you know, you guys won't return my phone calls and like, what's up? And then it just starts to breed this. Well, everybody's a bum, right? Or the whole thing must be broken because you guys can't even do this simple study thing or, or, or what have you. So I, I think there's, there's um, uh, a long history starting with the tobacco wars and all this and that about, about if you can't win the argument, you, you um, make people ticked off and you distract and you say, well, let's just let's just study it for a little while longer. Or how can we slow the process down? I think that's sort of part and parcel of the same kind of ideas, um, I think. And again, I, I also agree with the local control. It's it's day, one day it's local control and the other day it's well, we got to have federalism. And the next day it's, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, we made local control in this issue. And and so that that, you know, if some people really do believe in local control. I'm more than happy to have that conversation or federalism. But it's the. So often I don't see that as a genuine, um, an honest concern. I see it as a political expediency thing that's tossed out there, I guess. I, I completely agree. Um, I, I see from our tech whiz, we actually have a hand raised. If you oh, cool. Question and then keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, let's see, do I have it down here? Uh, uh, Stephen, you are being prompted to unmute. <laughs> Go ahead with your question now. All right. Um, Hi, everybody, and thank you for having this and um, allowing us to watch the movie. A question that I have when I watch something like that, and it is so painfully obvious that our, um, you know, our political leaders who profess to be so, you know, religious and Christian, they don't allow our indigenous people the same. The ability to sanctify the land that they live on, that that land is sacred to them, it's sacred to them, and it will be sacred to their children and grandchildren for seven generations and on. So how do we find a way to, um, you know, recognize that land can be sacred? Uh, you know, it just tears me up to see what we've done to some of these beautiful locations that, you um, that you know everybody understands what I'm talking about. So, I, you know, I don't know if there's an, an answer to that question. As you know, it's, it's more a, it's more of a philosophical question than a policy question. But it but it but it it, it is so frustrating that that, that we don't uh, acknowledge the be the beauty and the and the sacredness of, of, of uh, you know some some of these wonderful places. Who wants to? Uh, yeah. Go. I'll say it starts with um, just listening and an, an honest, respectful relationship between sovereign tribal nations and the, the federal government. I mean, um, Bears Ears is an interesting case. I think there are uh, there tribal co-management and uh, efforts to actually um, meaningfully engage tribes in managing lands. I think it's one of the next uh, biggest steps we can take. I mean, we're seeing it in Montana with. Um, National Bison Range, there are areas in uh, Utah uh, that are doing it as well. But I think it takes commitment and hard work. Um, and that's, I mean, from community groups, state governments, the federal government on up, it's something that's been long neglected. And I, I mean, it's our obligation. I, I'll, I'll just jump in um, to say that uh, I think some folks can be convinced. Some folks can be convinced. Uh, if I find that people don't necessarily, of say the the cohort of folks that might be pushing these policies, some of them uh, or supportive of them, some of them aren't aren't necessarily outdoor folks. And I found that when you do take folks outdoors and just hang and have a beer and 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 just talk, um, the the amazing transformational power of nature, which we all love can actually work wild. So I've been, I've been super blessed this last year, even though we're now all stuck here. But, but starting last summer, I was in northern New Mexico with my son for three weeks in, in uh, backpacking with our Boy Scout troop. Then we're in the Florida Keys, also with my son's Boy Scout troop, uh, all in protected areas and public lands. And then we spent, the day after Christmas, we went to Ely, Minnesota, into the Boundary Waters Canoe area and froze very cold, but it was great, it was cool. 
Um, but in one of those trips, there was a, a parent of one of the scouts who was someone that I would characterize as one of these folks that is like, you know, we got to burn it and we got to, this is a waste. This would be a great marina right here. You know, that, that kind of mentality. And we went out and came snorkeling and, and we, we, you know, all the stuff we did. And, and over the course of just a couple of days, he completely changed, completely changed. And he said, wow, I didn't realize how nuked the corals were. I didn't realize we've lost 70% of the corals in the Caribbean and in Southern Florida. And he said this, and he said his exact quote was, man, this climate change thing is real. I think we got to do something. And he, even before he got home, he was starting to email people and said, I think we need, to, we need to have some, we need to tell people about this. And so I think in some cases, when people's hearts are open, simply taking them to these wonderful places can be transformative. Um, but then I would say there are other folks like the James Watt. So the story I always remember of James Watt is, I mean, how cool is this? You're the, the head of the interior. You can go wherever you want. He goes on a, a, a multi-day rafting trip down the Colorado in the Grand Canyon, in the Grand Canyon of all things. How cool is that? Three days into it, he was bored. He called for a jet copter to come fly him out. So some folks like that, um, when you're in the, the grandeur of creation in this amazing place, there are some people that cannot perceive that and do not see the value of native peoples or the value of the landscape. But I think that's, that's a small fraction of the total people. Um, anyway, that, that, that's my, that's my response. Yeah, that's a, I totally agree with you, Sean, and, and what you said, Jesse. Um, I, I would also add that those personal relationships um, that we build in particular with, with tribal members and indigenous communities, I think, it, I guess, it, and in any, in any relationship really help bring to light those personal connections. And that when, when you know somebody who has those spiritual connections to the land, you might think of that person and the things that they care about when in a conversation with somebody or when considering um, an alternative use to those public lands, like something around mining and development. And, um, I think part of part of the work that I that we do at CLF, but also just in my in my own personal work um, here on the coast, is that in helping to elevate their voices and showcase um, the work that they're doing, again helps to build those personal connections with just bringing people to people, so that people better understand um, other frameworks and other perspectives and why public lands are so sacred to Indigenous people and and other and, and other people. And I'll, I'll just add, if I can, one other quick thing, which is um, there's tremendous value in the knowledge from Native folks. And so I think sometimes this is perceived as, oh, we don't want to hurt those poor, poor folks, but they need to be part of the conversation because they have some of the solutions that we need. And so most visibly right now in California, we're seeing that with, um, so if you go to Yosemite Valley and or at the bottom, of, you know, the, the valley floor, that only looks that way because the Native folks burned and burned and burned and burned that area. Um, to, to keep the, the, the trees sort of at the side and have this meadow type situation. And so there's more and more groups now that are given our crazy problems we have with fires, which is a whole nother conversation, but, but um, using native folks and native traditional burning practices to, to make things better. The same thing in Hawaii um, about uh, uh, fish ponds and, and things of that nature and sort of near shore stuff. There, there's tremendous things we can learn. And it's been interesting that as, as our the sort of casino phenomenon has grown up and some of our tribes have gotten more power, it is interesting to see how they now, um, in certain places in the Pacific Northwest, in Alaska and Canada, our First Nation peoples in Hawaii, that they, they have a strong presence and have always had a strong presence. But in places like Southern California and other places, maybe not so much, but, but there has been, I'm sensing a, a shift in terms of the power structure. And it's a bit more talking to colleagues as opposed to those poor little weird people over there that we only call out every once in a while that they really are asserting their their presence and offering things not just not just you know saying look at me kind of thing so i wanted to uh, look at a question that randall actually submitted in the chat um because it's near and dear to my heart um, which is if there's such a high public support for protection our extraction uh, extractive industry is getting access to our public lands and what can we do and, and this is something I, I think deserves a lot more attention than is getting, which is that the legal structures governing drilling and mining on public lands are old. Yeah. They are so old. So um, 
mining on public lands is governed under the General Mining Law of 1872. It's 150 years old, never updated. Um, and it, it has such outrageous things. It was designed to develop the West, mm -hmm. but uh, when a mining company um, extracts, whether it's gold, silver from public lands, they don't pay taxpayers anything for it. Um, for a long time, until the 90s, you could uh, set a mining claim and then turn that public land into private land. Um, so this law is still on the books and governing everything. And oil and gas is governed by the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920. This is the centennial of it. Um, and the same thing, it was meant to incentivize drilling on public lands in the West. And there are strong forces at play to keep those from being amended. Um, and so that's that, those are two of the things that I think we desperately need reform on. I, I think there's more attention about how broken the systems are when when stuff comes up, but that that to me is one of the next big things of revamping how our public grants are managed. So that's kind of a point of personal privilege. I don't know if either of the two of you have thoughts. Elian, or, uh, well, okay, I'll go while, while you're, oh no, please, you go, you go. Oh, I, no, I think Jesse touched on it. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a sad way in which lands are managed, but um, essentially that's, that's the, the issues, those are the issues that we're operating under. Um, at the same time, I would reiterate that the, um, that there is a public process in which the public can, can participate. Um, when there is a, a per, a, an application for a permit to explore or an application for a permit to um, to develop an area. And um, some of the work that our partners have been doing in, in the Eastern Sierra around an area called Conglomerate Mesa, which is um, just outside of the Owens Valley, a Canadian company um, called K2 Gold has come in and want, has been wanting to do some exploratory drilling to look for gold and the viability of um, having essentially an open pit gold mine in the area. Um, and it's got Joshua trees. It's, it's also next to a wilderness area. Um, the first, during the first round of their application permit, um, the communities in Lone Pine and Owens Valley and around the Eastern Sierra organized and did essentially a, a, a community outreach, community outpour against this company. It then led to them, the original company withdrawing their permit and, and leaving it there. So I, I would say that there is still power um, in community organizing when it comes to some of these local issues. Um, I, I'd say that uh, it's dysfunctional government and it's, it's allowing these things to happen. So the places where I see robust public engagement, um, picking up what my colleagues were saying, I see this less often. The place that I see it most frequently in the in my direct work. So I'm wearing a shirt. I wasn't gonna wear my Boy Scout uniform, but then I thought, oh my God, that's good. like that political stuff. Maybe that's not good. And but I, I engage with so many of the of our public lands with um, the Scouts, and it's a wonderful organization. Um, but anyway, but I wore a different shirt. This is a shirt from a place called Woodlands Plantation, in south of New Orleans, and I do a lot of work in Louisiana. Unbelievable landscape unbelievable landscape and how destroyed that landscape has been. So um, this is, you know, broad, flat, salt marsh. All these oil companies for, for decades have gone in there in mind. And, and the agreement, the public agreement that they, they pledged to, they signed legal contracts. They said, we're going to destroy this bit of this wetland. We're going to go and put a drilling rig. And when that oil and gas lease is, is done, or you know, we can't get any more oil and gas, we will, we will pull that pipe out and we will restore, we will fix that area that we created. They agreed to it. Nobody forced them to do that. They said, yeah, we'll do that. Almost none of them have done that. And when there was pushback in a lawsuit brought uh, uh, against some of these companies that, that failed to do their legal obligation, the minimum they, were, they said they would do, the absolute minimum, the state of Louisiana changed the laws to say that you can't sue oil and gas companies. So, so when you have that level of non-responsive government, um, and quite frankly, that's similar to the, I also have worked in Turkey and, and, and that government is non-functional either. Um, when you get to that level of, of non-functioning of basic de democratic principles, it's very easy for the powerful to go in and say, we're gonna do this. And particularly now when we're so divided, we can't even pass another COVID bill or, or anything like that that you'd think would be a relatively easy lift in the middle of a pandemic. 
um, it's much more difficult to get folks to pay attention to what might appear to be a, a, a niche issue or a side issue or something. So ultimately, I think it's our divided politics that is allowing the advances that are happening for the extractors right now. And, and I will say in response to your follow-up question, there, there are folks in Congress working on bills to uh, you know, fix some of these aspects of the law. I don't think there's a complete rewrite yet, but there are um, a, a lot of folks, particularly in the West, trying to work on specific fixes um, around companies paying their fair share, how we take care of abandoned mines and abandoned oil wells, how, how uh, what gets out of the ground is actually compensated. Like, so uh, there are a lot of people that are working on it, but I think it's going to take more political will. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Elian. One, one thing that I'm particularly interested in is the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan. Um, I know you guys are working on it, but for the Cal Desert, a pretty magical place. I wonder if you can just talk about how that, um, what's going on with it now in the current administration? Yeah, yeah. And I'll give some background. Um, the, the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan is a, essentially a, a management plan that was um, coordinated and negotiated through the BLM, um, the, the state government, and many other entities, Fish and Game. Um, and it's a plan whose goal is essentially to, to balance um, renewable energy development in the California desert that will help California meet our, our um, robust uh, renewable energy goals, in addition to balancing conservation in the California desert. And the planning area covers over 10 million acres um, in, in the California desert. And, it's in, and again, it's to balance those two renewable energy development with conservation. And within that plan, it identified some development focus areas. So areas that um, the agencies deemed appropriate for um, renewable energy. And then it also identified area, other areas for protection and conservation. So areas that were so pristine, so important to wildlife corridors, so important to um, protection and cultural protection and biological protection that they should should not be developed and those were set aside for conservation. Um, it was eight years in the making, eight years of negotiation among different agencies including BLM, California State, um, etc. It was finalized in the fall of 2016. Later on fast forward under the current administration um, the Trump administration then decided to um, essentially put it under review, and they were proposing to, they were proposing that the plan did not include enough areas for development, and that it wouldn't help the country meet this energy energy dominant goal that um, the Trump administ administration had created. But it's also notable that um, after eight years of negotiating, the plan was finalized in 2016. It was never litigated. And I know that's that's not a huge. <laughs> it doesn't sound like like all that great, but when you have so many agencies and so many entities and organizations and stakeholders involved, the fact that it was never litigated is actually a huge feat. And so um, many conservation organizations, as well as renewable energy um, uh, organizations, and um, California State BLM, as much as they could, and Fish and Game. Um, have been doing what we can to actually preserve that plan in its place and actually let let it roll out and let it let it be implemented before it can be um, taken apart by this administration. Um, and within within those lands um, that were de designated for conservation, it included 2.86 million acres of conservation area that protects Joshua trees, ancient Joshua trees, the desert tortoise. Um, and again, which a really important um, conservation and protection goal for such a, um, a really sensitive area. And I also want to note, you know, as we talk about climate mitigation and the role that public lands can play in, in mitigating the impacts of climate change, um, there are different ways to look at the role that public lands can play. And one, obviously, when you set aside public lands for protection, they can no longer be developed for future oil and gas, um, et cetera, that create more emissions. But also setting them aside, as we're learning more and more through more research and science, is that, in particular, the California desert is actually um, a carbon sink. The, the soils, which 
um, have been undeveloped for thousands and thousands of years are actually, a, a, it's a sink of carbon. And so when, not only when those are developed for development, extractive development, actually disturbing those soils releases um, a, lot, a lot of carbon and then exacerbates um, climate change. And so I think, yeah, just to reiterate the point of really the importance of set a, setting aside public lands um, to help us mitigate the impacts of climate change is really important. Um, so uh, I think sort of building on that, I would say, can you guys paint a picture for us if, if, what things might look like if, if these proposals, if the current proposals, for example, that were featured in the film or these other things that we're talking about, if, if our efforts to, to manage the desert, desert were to fail, um, what do you guys see our country, what do you guys see these, these areas looking like in, say, 20, 30 years if, if we don't hold the line on these things? So I, I had kind of a personal freak out moment the other day. One of, one of my uh, jobs for work is to track all of the awful interior departments. That, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, this administration is doing. That sucks. Really I'm awesome. sorry for you, dude. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, as the film showed, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is a big thing. But I, I just started to uh, take together all of the current proposals that are, that are going through right now. So we've got... Um, drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, expanding drilling in the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska, which is just to the west of it and is basically an Arctic Wildlife Refuge 2.0. There's now a proposal that's being approved to build an LNG pipeline from the north slope of Alaska down past Anchorage to export all of that gas. Um, it follows the same right of way of a private mining road that was just approved. It runs through gates of the Arctic National Park um, that will benefit a company that's paying David Bernhardt's former lobbying firm to lobby the Interior Department. They just got that approved. Um, they are going to approve a, a land management plan in western Alaska to open up vast swaths. And this is all in the face of climate change, where all of this, um, you know, whole uh, native villages are falling into the sea and having to be resettled up there. And they're proposing an entire new oil and gas infrastructure that's going to have to be hardened and some sort of like industrial warlike infrastructure to get oil out, all to ship this stuff overseas. And to me, that is the apocalyptic version of this is the state where I spent my honeymoon. I love it. Um, but that to me is if you if you get the full industry wish list, you start to fragment the last wildest places we have, all for oil and gas that we won't need in 20 or 30 years, and it's it's kind of bad. Now the just before I leave that, I think there's a positive side where I think the economics and the law and the public input will stop a lot of the bad stuff. Um, I don't think the economics work at all. Um, but there's hope. But that's that's what I see if we don't stop it in 20 or 30 years. Yeah. And, and in looking at, at issues here in California, you know, I think about the California desert and it's a it's a vast area of open space. Um, but there are also millions and millions of people that live around the California desert and that will, that are already suffering from impacts around air pollution and a warming climate, increased wildfires that then, you know, in, not only endanger people's homes and livelihoods, but also create worse air quality. Um, if we look 20, 30 years at un, unmitigated or un, unopposed development in the California desert, we all of those issues will only be exacerbated. Um, the air quality, the light pollution, all of those will be even worse um, for those in Southern California in particular. And, and in particular in the Inland Empire and um, the more urban parts of San Bernardino and Riverside County where there are a lot of um, low income people, people suffering from issues around asthma because of the air quality. Um, you know, you can only see those, those problems being exacerbated in those communities in particular being hurt even further. So Sean, what's, what's your view? What's your um, view? Uh, similar to your guys' view, I guess um, one of the things that I've learned from spending so much time working in New Orleans and working in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, um, that really was, I mean, there's many aspects of that, but, but 
the importance of, of catastrophe, the importance of, or we take Fukushima, or we take these things that are, um, they're horrible, but also they, they manage to take on this sort of outside, Hurricane Sandy, they manage to take on this outsized concept. And, and um, uh, I've been saying this for years, and unfortunately I was right, which sucks. <laughs> but, um, but when we talk about all our predictions from climate change, the thing I think people don't really understand is when we talk about sea level rise or, or, or days of, of you know, continuous insane high temperatures, all those predictions are the conservative predictions. All those predictions are what uh, Putin agreed to, uh, George Bush agreed to, India, all these countries that, that didn't believe climate change and wanted to play it down. That's the consensus of what we said. We'll, we'll freak everybody out if we get too, too realistic. But when you look at the models that talk about how our atmosphere will be changing, how critters will be moving around the planet, how water, how available water is, I mean, you know, <laughs> I was just I was just on a, a call the other day with Car the city of Carpinteria, which is a town on the coast here, that um, they're they're working on um, dealing with sea level rise, and so they said, well, you know, so 100 years from now, three level three level a uh, three foot rise in sea level, but we're going to plan for five to six feet just to be conservative, but even the models now are now seven and a half feet, and the reality is we've had models for years talk about 15 foot high sea level rise, and so I think I think sometimes. Um, uh, the public doesn't understand how dire a risk we are. And people like me sometimes freak out and say, that, worry that if we tell them the, the dire situation, it'll just turn everybody off and everybody will start drinking and say, oh, the game's over, right? But, but that is real. And I think that, that there are points before we get to the horribleness as we go down when some bad things will happen that there is opportunity to, to, to step back. The question is whether we have the wherewithal. And I guess one of the depressing things for me about the COVID situation, which is another one of these things, right? It's that, oh my God, here's this horrible thing. Here's the pathway forward, right? And this is a much more of a known thing. It's like, oh, all we gotta do is wear some masks and we gotta stay away from each other. And in a couple of weeks, we can kill this thing. We don't, we, we, I'm worried that we don't seem to have the wherewithal in our society to be an adult. And, uh, and so, yeah, there you go. Uh, just to keep myself from being overly depressed. <laughs> Sorry. The disaster talk. No, no, it's good. I'm there. I'm with you. Um, but I, I think that, that the rollback of Bears Ears was kind of that moment for yeah. public lands. Yeah. Like aside from climate, I think it was really galvanizing. I think it was a, a turning point, and there had been a lot of local fights. But this is one I'd never seen nationalized like that. Um, I, and just to bring it back to this election, I don't know if you guys have paid any attention at all to races in Montana, Colorado, or Arizona, but um, in Montana and Colorado, you've got two really tight Senate races, um, and all four candidates are trying to be, um, they're all misters, Mr. Public Lands, and run as far to the conservation side of things as possible. That's why you saw the Great American Outdoors Act pa uh, pass with funding for national park stuff. Um, so I think this goes back to the point of like, this stuff is popular and people on both sides know it. And they're they're trying to like run as far to that side as possible. I mean, same in Arizona with, with Mark Kelly and Martha McSally, but, um, but inland, like I've never seen uh, the scale of this. It's, Interesting. It's remarkable. Interesting. So I'm hoping that we've, we're getting more action. And it looks like, um, Stephen, you raised your hand. Do you have another question? Uh, more of a co comment about climate change. Um, I'm doing everything I can to try to pr promote uh, the uh, decarbonizing of our economy. And there's a lot that, and, and, and there's, there's, there's a lot that we can do as individuals. One is to, um, you know, get rid of your gas appliances. Uh, there are, you know, great alternatives from heat pumps to induction stovetops, uh, you name it. And also, you know, try to get yourself into an electric vehicle, uh, transportation. Um, you know, th this is all low hanging fruit. And, you know, we can do whatever is within our power to, um, you know, reduce our addiction to hydrocarbon. You know, the I, th I think I think the easier it is to uh, 
you know, just say no to some of these um, extractive um, uh, industries. So I just wanted to throw that out there. There, 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 there is a lot that we can do as, as individuals. Um, it's a good point. Let me let me talk about like you know we're talking about public lands here, and that's a big part of the problem right now for climate. Um, Twenty four percent of our national uh, climate emissions come from uh, fossil fuels extracted from public lands, and so we've talked about this push to uh, protect thirty percent of the country, but alongside that, a, a sister push is going to be making our public lands carbon neutral um, uh, or net zero, and that's a I think an imperative. So uh, ramping down fossil fuel extraction from them, but then also uh, promoting responsible solar where it makes sense, talking about carbon sinks, uh, regeneration. Because um, when you talk about, uh, trust me, I, I worked on um, reducing emissions from cars and EVs. That's like my whole career, I love it. Um, and now we're talking about a quarter of our country. I mean, transportation is like a third. If public lands, fossil fuels are a quarter, I mean, these are major drivers of our national emissions. So um, a huge, huge part of the solution. That's a great point. Yeah, I, th I think uh, one of my most favorite conferences to go to, normally I go to conferences with a bunch of uh, nerdy science -y folks and we do nerdy science -y things. But increasingly I go to other conferences and my most favorite one um, for the last many years has been this thing called Blue Tech, which is in, it's in San Diego or near San Diego. But, but the point is, it's, it's nerdy academia plus uh, industry plus government. And nobody talks about, oh my God, climate change is so horrible. <laughs> and nobody has to convince anyone. And these are major Wall Street investment firms. These are international uh, shippers and all this kind of stuff. And they get it. They get that there's a problem. And 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 they understand, and they want to go to the next spot. Let's go solve this, right? That's how we used to handle things, right? Want to go to the moon? Let's go to the moon, right? We have this this car that isn't working. We're going to add a build a thing called a seatbelt. And and you know, when did we become these wimps and these people so afraid and running from problems, right? I mean, I think it's much more empowering to to look this crazy, very scary beast in the eye and say, let's fix it, right? Let's go forward and. And that's a very empowering thing. And it's hard to explain how, from someone that nor normally looks at the, the, the failing system and how the system is decaying, it's really empowering to go hang out with some folks that, that are real folks. They're all different political spectrums, young, old, everything, and about making real jobs, real living wage jobs um, that don't suck and aren't, and, you know, challenge your mind. And, and produce good things, right? And it, even in this capitalist economy and all the other stuff, it still goes forward and, and there are pathways forward. And so, so I, I don't think we, it always has to be this deprivation type thing and, and we're gonna be suffering and horrible. It's awesome. We can go surf. We can go hike the Grand Canyon. I mean, that's awesome. Let's do that. Let's do stuff so we can keep doing those wonderful things. And I think sometimes um, when I get bummed out, I try to think about that stuff and say, you know what? there are exciting pathways forward. It's just a matter of following them. And there are people following, they just don't catch the news as much as the doom and gloomers like me. <laughs> well, and, and the thing that kind of goes without saying is we've had you know three and a half years of backsliding at the federal level, but um, at least in the Rocky Mountain West where I am, a lot of progress on the state and local level. Um, you know, Colorado and New Mexico passed sweeping climate bills. Um, public lands has been at the forefront of pretty much every Western state legislature. So I, I think we're, um, it's easy to get caught up in a lot of the, the national level stuff, but there's been some real progress um, closer to the ground. I think yeah. that was worth mentioning. And, and I'll add, and also in response to Roseanne, your your question around how we, how can we or you all best support the 30 by 30 effort? Um, there was a bill in the California State Legislature that um, was actually Assembly Bill 30, 3030, um, which was an attempt to create a vision for California that would then um, move us into an implementation plan that would set aside 30% of California's lands um, by the year 2030. And so as efforts and those conversations continue, um, the bill the bill unfortunately is 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 dead, um, but their efforts will continue to 
to move on in, in other forms. So if you can um, make calls to your legislators um, when the when bills are are introduced to show your support as constituents of California and within the districts um, for your own representatives, I think that's a great way to, to support the effort. And I would also say this is a, a wonderful effort in the sense that you can advocate with your city council for parks at the local level. I mean, we're talking about state lands. And then I think this is not going away because it's an international push as well. I mean, this has made it all the way up to the UN um, and a lot of international resources and engagement too. So um, I think it's here for the long haul. It's something where you're just, I mean, Gosh, all the, all the way from a, a local park or greenway or, or a riverfront, there's just a lot of ways to push for it. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask something um, that sort of builds on some of this conversation, but is also speaks a little bit more to the moment, which is, uh, so so Thousand Oaks, where where, where I am, where, where, where the church is and, and all that good stuff, is one of the most, uh, one of the cities with, for its size, the highest amount of green space um in the country i think fort collins is higher or or somewhere around there is higher but but um which is a great thing but we're a relatively affluent community right so oxnard down the down the street here um that is our largest city in the county which is much more diverse um doesn't have as much open space and protected area as as we do right and they have all the typical environmental justice things of the the power plants and the you know the whole the whole thing so I, i'm just wondering um is there something with what's going on now the reckoning about racial justice and and social justice um that might help us with some of these conversations or or are there some 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 ways we can sort of build upon that same energy of of accountability and and self-reflection and moving forward to do things better and more inclusively and stuff in our organizations and things yeah i mean there's there's a ton i mean from the from the top at the federal level of making sure that our parks and public lands actually tell a full cultural history of the u.s in terms of um representing all of our story i think um that's that's been a real important movement um m making sure that in our land management decisions a lot of uh, and these communities feel heard. I mean, one of the ones we're working on a bunch right now is around Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, mm. um, which some of you may be familiar with, but just an incredible landscape that's sacred to all of the tribes that trace their history to it. I mean, it's thousands of years of civilization, just remarkable stuff. Uh, it's threatened by oil and gas drilling right now. And so that's one where I think um, making sure that we have input and have, like are actually talking to people um, that's critical. I don't know. It, there's a lot more to do. It's it's hard to ar articulate, but I think it starts with uh, with listening and realizing that it's a space for everyone, and we need to make sure that the places actually reflect all all of our communities. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's spot on, Jesse. And I would it would build off of that too. I think um, Sean, some of your your data, your polling data alluded to. Um, the safety and, and how individuals may or may not feel safe in outdoor spaces. Um, I think part of part of how we make public lands and open spaces accessible to all people is understanding that people enjoy public lands in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, There's sort of your iconic hiker um, who may go out into the wilderness to be alone and, and look for solitude, but then there are other 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 people who enjoy public lands because it's a way for them to gather with their families. And in particular, right, you know, during this pandemic where it's, it's, it's not safe for us to have large family gatherings here at our homes, maybe going to a park um, and open spaces where you're out in the open air um, is a safer place to gather um, with, with some of your family members. So part of that is, and then um, within that, you know, creating parks and places that can accommodate larger gatherings. Um, is one way to look at how public lands can really create safer places and spaces for um, people of all backgrounds and different racial identities. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think of uh, one of the things I always think of in this discussion is uh, several years ago, right when I was coming down from Stanford, was uh, when Governor Schwarzenegger was the governor and he was um, pushing um, LNG uh, uh, terminals for, to, to bring um, 
um, liquefied natural gas from Australia to to California as as an environmentally more responsible thing was the argument, right? It's the natural gas as opposed to petroleum or, or coal, blah blah blah. But um, without going into the specifics or all the details, I should say, um, one of the places was going to be Oxnard. So so the port was going to be off of Malibu, or or, or the the terminal, excuse me, was going to be about seven miles off of Malibu, where these ships from Australia would dock. The material would go into this this pipeline. It would go underground, blah blah blah. blah. But then instead of surfacing in Santa Monica or Malibu, which was the you know linear distance, that's the easiest, the shortest distance, it went all the way to Oxnard. And I was like, why was that, right? Oh, that's because that's where the they already have some rail lines, they already have some power plants, so you know Malibu doesn't, so we wouldn't want to soil them. Yeah. And there was this very interesting state lands. So the a, the agency that controls the bottom of the ocean here in California on, on, is called the State Lands Commission. And so if you're going to put a pipeline, you have to get a lease from that entity. So, so long story short, this big, big hearing and all these people turned out and all these folks and, and the mayor at the time from um, uh, Malibu came up and said, you know, this is a bad idea, right? Testify, we shouldn't do it. And a bunch of people from Malibu said, yeah, we shouldn't do it. And a bunch of folks from Oxnard were there saying, yeah, don't do it. We shouldn't do it. Yeah. And the, the person from Malibu said, Wow, this is a really cool community. I've never been here before, right? Which is only about a, I don't know where she lived in Malibu, but you know, call it a half hour drive or so. And and the mayor from um, Oxnard said, ah, so love, so stoked you came here, right? Love to have you. We'd love to partner on more on more uh, lobbying or or more community topics that we that we can share together. Love to see you, you folks. State lands voted down the the LNG thing. And um, I, I don't want to say it never happened again, but I don't know of any other collaborations where <laughs> Malibu came to uh, came to Oxnard. Uh, uh, again, there, there, I don't want to be disparaging. There could be stuff I'm not aware of, but but there wasn't a massive connection of the two communities. I think that's fair to say. And 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 that really, to me, was such a massive missed opportunity, right? I mean, here people were together. They're finally together. Whatever their differences, they got together. But for our cultural reasons, for our arrogance reasons, for our whatever reasons. We couldn't still hold each other's hands, and that was a massively missed opportunity. So I hope that as we go forward, when when these opportunities present themselves for environmental justice and this stuff, it's not a one-off thing until we solve the bear's ears or the whatever. I hope it's that that we create longer-term Lego blocks, right? Like click those suckers together, and we should be together. Mm -hmm. I hope. Ah. Lego box killed the conversation. Oh my gosh. Sorry, we guys. I think we have time for one more question or if you want to wrap up with any closing comments. I'll turn it over to one of you guys. Well, I'll just start that. I think it's easy to get, get depressed about a lot of this stuff. And particularly when you kind of add up a lot of the things that have happened in the past few years. But I, I really do think one of my takeaways from the film was showing a lot of hope and a lot of energy and a lot of positivity. I mean, um, we work, we work a lot around the West. Um, I, I've worked with a lot of folks in that film and I feel, um, that, that there is hope and it's really in people that care about it and actually get to work and do something about it. I, I think you can't discount what it actually means in terms of contacting a legislator, and, you know, going to a meeting or just voting. Like, I think we can actually make a difference. So I think that's, that's my takeaway. In the face of darkness, I do think there's some light, and I think it's it's strong. We just got to get there. Yeah, yeah, Jesse. That that was my word exactly. Um, hopeful. Um, I I'm also really inspired by by the stories, particularly the ones highlighted in the public trust film, Angelo's story and Bernadette's story. They've been fighting and advocating for these places for years and years. And they have leaders before them that were fighting to protect and, and preserve those places. And um, I remain really inspired by um, those advocates and the, the people on the ground that day-to-day -day work um, where they can't differentiate between protecting those places because it means the it, it means the well-being and the survival of, of their people and their communities. So. Um, because of them, I, I remain hopeful. Uh, I would say um, be a laser beam. 
I think in these times, it's very easy to be distracted by all the chaos, all the, the, the next, oh my God, that just happened today. Oh my God, that just happened today. And we can get, I can get caught up in the what? Um, pick an, an, an issue or two that's important to you and focus on that and stay focused. And that really helps um, you to you know, understand what's going on and to be able to make um, some difference and to not get distracted, particularly when it's something like protected areas, right? Which is what we've shown, everybody loves protected areas or the vast majority of folks. So if you pick an issue where most of us have agreement, it's that much easier. So you can go to that cocktail party whenever we have cocktail parties again, and you can, you can bring that up and not worry that you're gonna be ticking everybody off and stepping on someone's tail. Right, that you could say, hey, you guys really do need to pay attention to this issue, and this is important. So I'd say, I'd say, pick a few, one or two issues, and just really focus on that, and put your energies on that, and not get distracted by all the crazy scandal here and the scandal there and the outrage here. And that I think is an easier way to to make real progress. Well, I want to say thank you for being laser beams <laughs> and for being warriors in this work and giving us all hope. So everybody, we're gonna unmute you for a second to help me thank Elian Stefanik, Jesse Prentice Dunn, and Dr. Sean Anderson. Or you can use your clap signal. <laughs> clap thank reaction. You. Thank you. <laughs> you guys are phenomenal. And this was a, a pretty exciting uh, conversation. And uh, we're so grateful. Um, I want to thank the community forum team and all of our audience for being here tonight.